Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship today. Our call to worship is on the screen. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us. With you, O God, is the well of life. Our opening hymn this morning is number 290 in your hymn books, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Thank you. Please be seated. Please join me in prayer. God, ever creating, ever loving, ever leading, you are stillness when we are frantic. You are truth when we are perplexed. You give us freedom when fear takes hold. You send light when we have lost our way. You are love when we feel lonely and empty. You give us energy when we are ready to reach out. We praise you, Creator, Christ, and Spirit, for all that you are, all that you have been, and all that you will be for us. In our worship, we offer you our love and our loyalty, now and always. Compassionate and just God, you sent Jesus to seek and to save the lost. Yet it's hard for us to recognize that we too can lose our way. We seek the next new thing instead of your gift of new life. We follow the trends and moods of our culture rather than Jesus. We protect our own interests first, ignoring those who need help the most. And we are made easily fearful and anxious by the burdens of the past, the challenges of the present, and the uncertainty of the future. We cling to our hurts and our burdens, refusing to forgive, refusing to let you in, loving God, to heal us and to make us whole. 
Holy and merciful God, we have sinned against you and against one another in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, renewing our commitment to wait confidently, to work diligently, and to love without limit for your Son's sake. Almighty God, your Son Jesus is long gone from the stable, yet he is present with us in every time and place. In him you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace, we pray, and in the renewal of our lives, make known your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, hear the good news. Though we are unworthy, we are granted God's favor in Jesus Christ, and we are made one with Jesus in his church. To those who truly repent, our merciful God offers pardon and forgiveness of all our sins, opportunity to try again each day, and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit to help us and to make us whole. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This morning's scripture reading is taken from the New Testament, John 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city, Andrew, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, here is, a truly, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see the heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Yvonne. I think it's safe to say that probably most of you know who Elvis Presley was, right? Okay. Even if his music isn't your style, he is pretty well known, instantly recognizable in appearance and voice. Such was his impact on the popular music world during his lifetime, and it's continued long afterwards. Now, it is hard to imagine Elvis in a musical and commercial slump, but he definitely was during the 1960s. After seven years of films and soundtracks of, let's call it, varying quality, by 1968, Elvis was not a bankable star. But you know, I think everyone loves a comeback story because at the tail end of the decade, he pulled himself together, returned to his rock and roll roots and reascended to even greater popular heights. And one of the songs that propelled Elvis back to stardom was the 1969 number one hit, Suspicious Minds. Now, if you haven't heard it, it's a song about a, a distrustful and dysfunctional relationship and the need to overcome those mistrustful feelings for the relationship to continue. If you have heard it, I apologize because now it's stuck in your head for the rest of the day. <laughs> because even though it is a sad song, Elvis sung it with his usual flair for drama and that powerful voice and it was very catchy. The chorus is especially powerful and poignant. We can't go on together with suspicious minds, and we can't build our dreams on suspicious minds. The song, of course, is about a romantic relationship, 
But there are all kinds of relationships that people can have with each other. And a suspicious, distrustful mind is enough to break any relationship or nip it in the bud before it even starts to grow. And Nathaniel, from our scripture reading this morning, had a very suspicious mind. Nathaniel also experienced an unbelievably quick change of that mind, and all it took was meeting Jesus. And when his good friend Philip came to tell Nathaniel about this person that he'd met, someone who Philip believed was the fulfillment of all of their ancient hopes and all the promises that God had made, someone who Philip had decided already to follow, Nathaniel was skeptical. I think we get a really sort of <clears throat> clear glimpse of Nathaniel's personality. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel asks. But you know, even though it sounds mean, maybe he wasn't wrong. Jesus rounds out our picture of Nathaniel by describing him as an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And that seems to be a good thing. And Jesus doesn't disagree with Nathaniel about Nazareth's reputation. Honest Nathaniel does not mince words, and he doesn't fail to think and assess the truth of new information as he receives it. He isn't one to fall prey to being manipulated or fake news, as we used to call it. He must have been a good person to have as a friend. Philip certainly thought so. And it's always been my belief that there is nothing wrong with a genuinely asked question. And that seems to be Nathaniel's primary way of speaking, because all he does is ask questions until he meets Jesus. And Jesus doesn't tell him to stop asking questions or to stop being so blunt. Jesus encourages Nathaniel and practically dares him to stick around. If you thought me seeing you under the fig tree was good, wait till you see what happens next. Nathaniel changes his mind almost instantaneously. After his two suspicious questions, we get two exclamation-pointed statements of faith and hope. You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. That is a quick change of mind. We often think that it's the burdens and the challenges and the tragedies of life that will lead people to Jesus. That people without faith or people with a forgotten faith will find God in their lowest moments and turn to God and build a new faith in the wake of that meeting in sadness or in tragedy. And perhaps for some people that is how it happens, but it only happens that way sometimes in scripture, like with a, a healing miracle. It's more usual in scripture, especially for Jesus's long-term followers and disciples. It's more usual that people would meet Jesus on ordinary days and were uplifted into joy and awe from there. That faith grew from an encounter full of wonder and happiness and immediate recognition of the divine presence of God that Christ embodied. The tricky bit, the, the bumpy road, is hanging on to that faith, born out of the ordinary that, that uplifted you into joy, hanging on to that faith in the face of the gritty realities of our world. Faith doesn't stop us noticing or experiencing bad things. Sometimes our faith and our trust in God cause us to weep even more than those who don't believe in anything greater or more loving than humanity. The good news of Jesus' coming kingdom and the, the Christian way for living often have a hard time making much headway in a deceitful and cynical and suffering world. And many of us gathered here this morning know all about this. The first few weeks of every new year are rife with retrospectives on the year that's been. And 2023 wasn't a pretty year. In February, there was that terrible earthquake in Turkey and Syria that killed tens of thousands of people. The war between Ukraine and Russia continued and still continues. And since October, we have a new and terrible conflict between Israel and Hamas. In our own country, the wildfires during the summer in places as distant and unexpected as Nova Scotia and the Northwest Territories were devastating, as was the quiet pain of the national increase in the use of food banks. In one month alone, there was a 78% jump in people accessing food banks compared between 2019 and 2023. Closer to home, closer to the heart, we have lost friends and loved ones 
suffered illnesses and long healing journeys, weathered conflicts and challenges within our families and difficult situations in our communities, and just plain worried over our loved ones and ourselves and the future. We still and forever believe in Jesus, full of wonder and awe. But our eyes are open and our brains are working, and we are forced to engage again and again with the very realities that required God's Son to be born to us in the first place, in the middle of life's struggles and sorrows. We follow Jesus in the light of his birth and the wonder of that welcoming and beckoning star, but we know we also follow Jesus in the shadow of his cross. And it was the cross, Jesus' death and resurrection, that was finally needed to begin setting all things right and making all things whole in this world and in us once more. The only place in scripture where we ever see Nathaniel again is on the other side of the cross, years and chapters later, at the end of the Gospel of John. And it's one of my favorite passages in scripture. Peter and Thomas, the sons of Zebedee and Nathaniel, were once again by the sea and had been fishing unsuccessfully all night long. Nathaniel had indeed seen many exciting and wonderful and terrible things in Jesus' company in the years since that first meeting, as Jesus laughingly promised him he would. And Nathaniel was about to see something even more extraordinary. Jesus' life and ministry would have been something special, I think, to witness firsthand. It's been a, a world and life-changing one for everyone since, we who have only read about it and believed. But the horror and the grief of Jesus' public execution must have been overshadowing all else for these closest friends and followers of his at that time. As morning dawned, a figure on the beach shouted out, Friends, have you caught anything yet? And of course they hadn't. And of course, it was Jesus. No one had any questions, suspicious or otherwise, about that. There was an ordinary shore breakfast of charcoal baked fish and a serious conversation about forgiveness and the feeding of Jesus's sheep. <clears throat> but more than that, it was the ultimate reversal of all expectations, a revision of grim reality. Jesus was there with them again, having been to hell and back and bearing the scars to prove it, but he was undeniably there and alive. When Jesus so long ago had said to Nathanael, do you believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than these. He really meant it. And Nathanael was seeing that greater thing right then. That meeting where Nathanael's suspicious mind was transformed, his faith grew from that moment of joyous recognition. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. It led him to have a faith that lasted even as loss and turmoil and Jesus' own death attacked that faith. It's a challenge to hold on to our faith when we are burdened by the realities of life in this world in our shared and personal low moments. A faith built on a, a joyful or a sorrowful encounter might well falter, especially if our minds are full of suspicions, full of distrust, ready to accuse God and lash out at him at the first sign of trouble. Because, you know, it is the trust part of our faith with Jesus that keeps hope alive in every circumstance. It's our willingness to trust and to hope, to embrace and believe, that lets faith flourish in low moments, on ordinary days, or in joyful meetings with Jesus, all alike. But I think even more than that lesson about faith, Nathaniel also offers us a model of faithful following of Jesus that is perhaps a little different than we expect. Like Nathaniel, we may find ourselves full of questions, maybe even suspicious, distrustful ones, when we hear about Jesus or the church or religion, or we may be full of, of simply curious questions collected as we journey through life, learning and experiencing and exploring. And that is okay, as it turns out. Jesus welcomed all of that when it came with an honest heart and a mind open to truly meeting him and listening to the answers. 
We may also find ourselves, though, deeply burdened by the realities of the world, by the kind of loss and uncertainty and grief that must have attended Jesus' death on the cross. And coming to Jesus from that place, emotionally and spiritually, that was something Jesus welcomed too. We are invited to come and see Jesus, maybe even follow him, with a suspicious mind and all our questions, with our burdens, or with the joy of discovery and recognition. The only thing, the only thing I think we must come to Jesus with is a sense of anticipation, of trusting hope to see what greater things that Jesus may yet do. From the high and awesome moments of joyfully meeting and recognizing Jesus through the realities of life, a faith in Jesus that trusts and hopes, well, to borrow a few words from the king of rock and roll, a faith that trusts will help us go on together and build Jesus' dream of a world made right and new and whole. Thanks be to God. Amen. For our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession this morning, the response is on the screen. Lord, revealed in the world, hear our prayer. And the Lord's Prayer will be on the screen at the end for our unison prayer. Let us pray. We thank you, eternal and glorious God. By your divine power, you have given us everything we need to live a life of abundance that pleases and honors you. We have received all your many gifts and blessings by coming to know your Son, our Lord Jesus, who called us to himself, inviting us to become part of his family. We thank you for the good things in our lives and with our lives, gifts from you that bless us further. Family and friends, meaningful work, creative abilities, special talents, a church to belong to. You bless us so abundantly, loving Father. We thank you, too, for the generous promises you have made and kept as you continue to abide with us and to empower us through your spirit, deepening our faith and trust in you. Believing in those promises, gracious God, and trusting in your loving care and saving intention for all creation, we come to you now in prayer. Lord, revealed in the world, hear our prayer. Sovereign God, we pray for those who lead, nations, cities, towns, businesses, and organizations of all sizes. Help those who have power to use it wisely and generously, and for the benefit of those who have no power at all. Shape their hearts and minds in the image of your Son, so that those who need mercy and compassion may begin to receive it. Today we remember before you people living face to face with war and violence, in places where hatred has been stirred up and fear stalks people on their own streets. We pray for all those displaced by conflict, seeking refuge among us or in camps and communities around the world. And we pray for those who are challenged with difficult decisions and impossible situations as they seek peace and safety for their families, their communities, their nations. Lord, revealed in the world. Living God, we pray for your church in all its diversity, around the world, here in Canada, within the Presbyterian Church in Canada, and for our own St. Andrew's community, including those who will join this worship service online or on television. Together you have entrusted to us a share in the ministry of your Son, our Savior. Inspire by your Holy Spirit the hearts of many to discern and put to good use the particular gifts with which you have blessed each one of us, building up the body of Christ, revealing the just and merciful promises of your kingdom to a world in need of light and new life in these ever difficult days. Lord, revealed in the world. Compassionate and gentle God, we remember before you those struggling in these uncertain economic times, those who have lost their jobs or worry about making ends meet, those who are dealing with difficult family situations or relationships, those who are struggling to cope with the uncertainty of aging and change. We pray for those who are facing illness and suffering in their lives or witnessing it, witnessing it in the lives of those they love. For those struggling with disability and lack of access or needed resources, and for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one or a friend, in this moment of silent prayer, we speak in our hearts the burdens we bear today.
pour out your peace upon us and those for whom we have prayed. Lord, revealed in the world, hear our prayer. God of glory, you nourish us with your word, who is the bread of life. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, we pray, that through us the light of your glory may shine in all the world. Rejoicing in the presence of God here among us, as our Savior taught us, so we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Lord of All Power, number 626, if you'd like to use your hymn books. Please join me in our words of sending. Before you were born, God knew you. God searches out your paths and accompanies you along your way. There is nowhere you can go where God is not with you. Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory and uplift your hearts with the good news of his kingdom. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Spirit be upon you and those whom you love this day and always. Amen. Amen.